<laughs> sure, um, go for it. Awesome. Hi. Hey, great to meet you. Great to meet you again. So yeah, we're on this book writing journey together. And yeah. I would just love to know more about what you do. So if you could just take a second and, and introduce yourself, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Patrick Frank, and currently my focus is uh, running a company called Edit Video Calls. And at Edit Video Calls, we take everyday Zoom conversations like this one, find the little shareable moments for marketing and training, and clip them into those shareable one to three minute videos that are branded, that uh, use our clients' colors and um, fonts and things like that put a little call to action at the end and we deliver them weekly. So that client, and we work mainly with coaches and consultants. So they get a cool video every week that they can post on social media. It's also great for uh, capturing testimonials. Uh, you can put it on your website and um, also training. So a lot of people find themselves saying the same thing over and over again in Zoom calls. So if you captured it one time and then you could clip it, put it into a little package and when that conversation is going to come up again, just say, Hey, do me a favor. Just, can you just watch this video before we hop on the call? I think it's going to answer a lot of questions for you. Yeah. And now all of a sudden that call goes from 60 minutes to 30 minutes, or you could eliminate it all together. And that 30 minutes is much better spent because that person already knows what the deal is. And they, you can just answer their questions and stuff like that. So I think I just, my message to everyone is just record all your zoom calls. And we just hopped on and you're like, Oh wait, I got to record right away. I think it's great. That's the idea because there's all kinds of really cool things that happen in these everyday conversations. And if you just hang up, you'll lose it. But because this is the one cool thing that we have access to now that we're not having coffee meetings and face-to-face -face networking and things like that is that we can record, all, save all these conversations, reference them, share them, that sort of thing. Yeah. That's what I'm all about right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so awesome because I literally, so I recorded the first one of these on Sunday. So I go into this book writing thing. I'm 19 years old. I'm in my second year of college. And I'm starting to learn that balancing schoolwork with all these other things is getting a little hectic. And I go and I record my first one. And it was so amazing because I just emailed someone and they said yes. And right. Yeah. And I reached out to you and you said yes. And I'm like, holy cow, like, what are these people? Why do they want to talk to me? But I reached out to someone, they said yes. And I record the whole thing. And I'm like, all right, what do I do with this one hour thing? Like I was literally gonna, I'm like, I'm so glad I'm gonna talk to, to Patrick because. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I went and I, I threw it on YouTube and I threw it on Anchor. I, I just- Oh, nice. It awesome. And I threw it on Anchor. And I, I was looking at my listening statistics this week. And it's so funny. You look, it was my first one. So it's a little awkward. So the first eight <laughs> minutes are, are even, they're pretty like tough to get yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like all my friends and family, super nice people. They basically all watch the first eight minutes and then it all drops off after that. So definitely- Well, and I, and I think that's the idea is like, you have to- have the right video for when you meet the person. And you can think about it. I'm sure you're familiar with funnels and marketing funnels and things like that. But I think that you can think of, there, there's also, it's, it's related, but it's almost separate. Like there's a video funnel, right? Where like the top of your funnel, that's a short awareness video where in a 30 second ad that you might see on Facebook or something like that, it's here's who we are, here's what we do. Then Below that is a video that you would see on your website. And that would be like a 90 second homepage video. Then below that, they start clicking on your pages a little bit more going down the funnel. Now you have a three or five minute, like about the company, who we are, why we got started, that sort of thing. Then when they purchase, now you have a really long video, right? Depending on what you're selling, it's a total walkthrough of the platform or like some other kind of webinar training videos, like that sort of thing. There's like a parallel video funnel that works alongside your marketing funnel. And it's just all about having the most relevant video for that person and where they are in that journey. Yeah. And so if you're, if, someone, if no one's ever heard of you and you send them an hour long video, like, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not appropriate. But if you send them a 30 second video, or if they, you know, happen to see a 30 second video, and they're interested. Now they'll watch a 90 second video. Now they'll watch a five minute video. Now they'll watch a 30 minute video. You know what I mean? It's like the more interested they are in what you're doing, the longer the video yeah. can be and that they'll stay interested. Yeah. And that's such, and you obviously talked about that's such a great thing about this is I can now create all these different touch points for, cause I don't have a company or anything, but it's just for people to get to know me and understand what I'm about. And I can go use my network, say on LinkedIn, put the 30 second video there, but then I can link my website. You go to my website and other things that I'm working on. And I'll share, this is my plan too. Like when you said that you were going to put it on YouTube and stuff like that, I got really excited because I'm totally going to do the same thing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I'll do YouTube and like post the whole conversation, 
but I am absolutely planning to go pluck out the best parts of conversations and share them on LinkedIn. Hey, I'm working on this book. I talked to this person. It was really interesting. That piece might not even make it in the book, but just shows that, yeah. hey, I'm working on this thing. Here's some of the, the, the one thing I really love about this kind of format and this idea of sharing just everyday conversations is it shows people, your followers, your network, what questions you ask what you care about, what you think about. Because there's so many decisions that go into this. What clip do I choose? What question do I ask when I have this person on the call? And when you share that stuff and you can, people can see how you think and how you converse and interact, it tells a lot about you. Even if you're not talking about yourself, which is even better because you're not like pitching anything. You're not selling anything. You're just talking. And so anytime I see these ads with these like, these, do you want to make $15 million? I got the secret, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, Screw you, man. Like all these, I call it ad splaining, like mansplaining, but ads. I love that word. I yeah. don't want to be ad splained. You know what I mean? Like I would rather, I saw a really good ad for uh, the hustle, Sampar. Yeah, newsletter. Yeah. Trends. Uh, trends.co. What is this? Trends. Thing? Yeah, anyway. Yeah, trends. Yeah. The, the person I, I interviewed on Sunday works and writes for trends.co is Steph Smith. Oh, cool. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Man, we might, you might need to share that contact yeah. with me. I saw that they had repurposed the interview that they did with Gary V in an ad. And it was just like this cool back and forth about, hey, here's what we're building and here's what we get excited about. And Gary's, oh yeah, that's so great. I see that all the time. Ton of value there. Totally get the business model. That's it. That was the ad. Like it literally was just like them talking. Yeah. And so you get that social proof of him talking to Gary V, obviously. But it wasn't him saying, we have the best ideas. Like you're going to get this and this. It was just, hey, this is how we talk and this is who I am and, and as I'm talking in this conversation, I just think it's like conversations are underrated when it comes to marketing. Exactly. There's something so real about that. Cause I can, yeah. if we were selling something right now, if we were discussing a product, there's something so real about this. It's you sitting in your room at home. It's me sitting in my room at home. There's nothing artificial. There's nothing right. really going on here. Exactly. We're just having a real conversation. Exactly. Uh, and I think people trust that a lot more, especially. And that's really what I've arrived at. I started a pretty traditional video production company about seven years ago. I live in Washington, DC, and I've worked with a lot of like large nonprofits and associations and universities in the area. Some small businesses, but I've never done any like big, I never like worked for Under Armour or anything like that. But my niche is real like documentary style and narrative and animated explainers and like traditional, what I would call like a brand story video. And I got set on this path because back in March when everything was shut down and it was literally illegal for me to film anything, I had a client and we were supposed to go film at a community college in Maryland and that got canceled. And then we were like, oh crap, what are we going to do? This video is due in three weeks and we have no idea what we're going to do for this video. And so we had this idea, like, can we do it on Zoom? Everyone was familiar enough with Zoom. I had used it a little bit before, but the best part about Zoom is that there's a big record button at the bottom of every call, whether you're on a free plan or a paid plan. And it's just amazing. And so... Our interviewee pool grew from just the people in Maryland to, hey, there's actually a program leader out in Phoenix. Maybe we should talk to her. And there's someone else in Los Angeles. Maybe we can get them on the phone and get them, get their thoughts on this program and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden now we have like all these people. It's this national piece now that it wasn't before. It was just like, we were just going to really focus on this one school. And all of a sudden we made it this way broader and it was Honestly, the video turned out as well as it would have if we would have done the traditional filming route. And that's when I said, all right, I'm done with this camera stuff. I don't, wanna, I don't need to film anything anymore. Yeah. That's it. And then edit video calls is basically just the simpler version of that. Like you strip out the B-roll, you strip out the fancy editing, and you just really focus on finding that one, one to three minute piece that you can clean up a little bit, but you don't really go too over the top with the editing. And just more videos, faster, less expensive, that's the whole idea. Yeah, that's awesome. And I so I checked out some of the work at edit video calls. And that was the great thing about it too, is that it was so powerful for certain people. And people talked about getting speaking engagements. And it's exactly what you mentioned. People can interact with people better because there's something a little bit amorphous about a video call in that you can show different parts of your personality, your thought process, your creativity that you wouldn't be able to in a traditional, like a job application, in written word, or, or even in your conversations. I have people come up to me, and so I've had a blog for a little bit over a month now, but people do okay. tell me, like my friends, they're like, the person that writes in there is not the person that we think we talk to sometimes. And I was thinking about that. And That's interesting. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, 
using technology to humanize ourselves. We can show different parts of ourselves in this medium that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. And so I think, right, edit video calls is obviously a tremendous service. And so, right, now going from there and the work that you do, you decided to write this uh, book. And so what are you most excited about in this book writing process? And what are you really looking to get out of it when it's all said and done? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing for me is there are people that are way smarter than me in the networking space and in the kind of more broad marketing space. Like I'm really good at video and I understand that. I know how to make a video, but sometimes there's a disconnect between making a video and passing it off and watching it get implemented poorly. And you're just like, oh man, like this video should have had way more impact than it did. And it's just kind of out of my control. And so that's something that I've been trying to get better at learning more at, about over, you know, the last decade really. But so my goal is really to, I, I, and the other thing too, is we look at, so we're talking in mid October, we got the largest single day COVID positive tests since July. This isn't going away anytime soon. And I think increasingly large conferences and other people are just going to say, you know what, we're just going to keep doing this virtual conference thing. It's fine. It's working. I think employers are going to like it too, because then that employee of theirs, they don't have to pay for them to go to the conference, yeah. but then they're also losing the time that they're working for the company when they're at the conference. You know what I mean? So they get hit twice. So it better be really good in order to send your employees to a big conference. And so I think, so my question that I'm trying to answer is what does that mean for networking? And so I think that like my kind of idea and like the Zoom stuff is part of it. But I think that there's other things too that I don't know about as far as alternative ways of networking and marketing and growing your client base and stuff like that. So I want to learn from event people and marketing people, what does the next 18 months or more look like as far as how marketing is changing and networking? So that's really what I'm trying to get out of this. Yeah. And then you're going to have a way to explain it to other people, which is going to be really useful because they, right. it does feel like there's this kind of tectonic plate shift going on in the way that we consume information, learn new things. I'm at home, but I'm at college right now. And so what does that right. mean? That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't help but notice going through the content index that one of the people that you said you wanted to interview was, was Gary Vee, right? Yeah, that's kind of like my top of the top, but I don't need to interview him because kind of like Eric, our <laughs> professor says, <laughs> famous people, there you already have all the interviews out there. Yeah. If you're lucky, maybe you might get them, but you shouldn't have to because they've just done so much stuff. Literally, that guy has had someone follow him around with a camera every day for 10 years. It's more than that. Yeah, so, I just resonated with that so much because obviously I've seen a lot of the stuff he does and I love it too. Yeah. But thinking about what, right, thinking about using this book to plug into whatever community that we're interested in, I, I want to learn more about what it means to be a creator and what it means to be a creator now. And so, right, I had the same thing. I was like, top of my list, who I want to interview, it's like Paul Graham, right, or Michael Siebel, whoever this CEO of Y Combinator is right now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, right, in my head, it's like a pipe dream, but it's conversations like this that make me feel like, we have the ability to learn from each other in a way that's really powerful now, but also we have the ability to interact with people in a way that we, we weren't always able to. Right. That's interesting that, that those are the people that you want to talk to, as opposed to like when you said indie hackers and like indie makers and stuff like that. Yeah. I feel like that's the opposite of the venture backed kind of traditional yeah. startup. Yeah, I feel like we're, we are so far on back in the mid nineties when the internet was first starting, it was all tinkerers and people just hobbyists. And then all of a sudden like that sort of got professionalized and then Google came around and then Facebook in 2004. And so we've swung completely in the opposite direction. And now the whole point of having a startup is just to get bought by Google or Facebook or something. You know what I mean? And I, the pendulum is swinging back the other way slowly. And I think cryptocurrency and stuff is like helped is going back to that kind of hobbyist and tinkering kind of roots. But when I think about indie hackers, I think of the anti Y Combinator really, because they're people that are just bootstrapping that are doing stuff after their nine to five job nights and weekends. And some of them like take the plunge and it's really cool. Do you know Daniel Vasallo on Twitter? Have you seen him? No, I haven't. So there's, I'll give you like 10 people like off the top of my head that you should talk to. He left his AWS job in Seattle where he was making like 400, 500 K a year. And he was basically like, this is unfulfilling. I'm on this hamster wheel, 
the more money I make, the more I realize how unnecessary and dumb it is. And I'm just like wasting away in this large, like working for Amazon basically. So we quit and then he started just writing stuff that you and I are doing and putting stuff out there and talked about why he quit. And, uh, and then he sold a product on Gumroad, which is a, you know, digital mm-hmm. products marketplace yeah. called the best parts of AWS. And it's aimed at developers. I've seen that. All of a sudden, oh yeah. Okay, cool. And so he started getting a lot of traction that way. And then he grew his Twitter following to like, he's probably at 30 or 40,000 right now. And then he wrote another course, which I bought called how to grow your Twitter audience. And he basically just documented his own process. And like from a video perspective, I watched this and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. This is crazy. It's just literally, it's a loom video of a guy talking, going through his slides. That's literally it. And it costs 40 or 50 bucks. And I was just like, wow, I have been overthinking this like crazy. And he just crossed like 250K in sales in less than a year for just those two info products. Yeah. That's it. Like that's Andy Hacker, I think. So that's the kind of guy you got to talk to. And then there's another guy in Germany named Arvid Kahl who has the same thing. And his whole thing is about bootstrapping a web development business. But he's also just like very active, very generous on Twitter. And I feel, and I'm not a developer, obviously, but I I see all these developers that are embracing this whole building in public. And and that's a big kind of buzzword right now, but they're doing it and they're growing their audiences and they're finding out what pain points people have. And they're like, that's it. It's awesome. Yeah. And the greatest part about building in public is it's the, it's the same thing that we were talking about before you let people know what sort of questions you're asking. So you let them know what you're right. doing. And the amazing thing is I, I just started getting on Twitter and I'm just starting to realize what a powerful tool Twitter is. And it just snowballs, right? Stuff just snowballs. More people start helping you where you start building something and that sort of snowballs. Totally. Um, and this passion economy that's mm-hmm. growing and growing and growing, especially right now. And as you mentioned, I don't think it's stopping anytime soon. It's worth right billions of dollars now. And there's so many tools, right? You mentioned Gumroad, but there's so many different little ways to monetize your, your content. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I see it right in Ghost being able to monetize a newsletter. So then people are going to start moving towards independent. Substack, yep. Exactly. So it's, I, I love this idea of the pendulum swinging one way and then coming back the other way. Cause now we're getting smaller and smaller and right. People that are making $5,000 a month, $10,000 a month, even $1,000 a month, building something that sustains them wherever they are outside of their job or chipping away and making a substantial impact on everyone's life. The guy that, you know, built that course he made a pretty big living from that. I, I don't, I didn't even remember his name, but I've heard of that book and it's, it's, yeah. so that's really interesting. Yeah. I think there's like a lot of pendulums in life and in different things. Like someone told me one time about like the NFL, there was a time where running backs were the big thing. And because everyone was drafting running backs, they didn't really care too much about the secondary, like your cornerbacks and your safeties and stuff. And then people started really investing in wide receivers instead of running backs, burning the secondary. Oh, now we got to invest in defense. Now we don't care about running backs anymore. And then it's just a circle. It just goes back and forth. Same with the NBA. It used to be you got Shaq and Akeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing, big centers, anchoring, like standing on the block and everything was twos. And now you got the Houston Rockets that put out five guys that are all between 6'3 and 6'7 and everybody, and they shoot like 43s a game. Like, it's just like crazy. That's not, and I think that's a good analogy for business too. Like the way things are done one way, someone comes in, disrupts it and the pendulum swings back the other way. And now I think we're, like, I cannot imagine we get any more consolidated than we do now as far as big tech companies and like all the congressional hearings and antitrust and stuff like that. And who knows what's going to happen. I'm sure the election is going to impact that. I'm sure the Supreme Court is going to impact that and stuff like that. We'll see. It just feels like, to me, it feels like Facebook and Amazon at the very least need to be need to be split into three or four different companies. You know what I mean? It's like Instagram and Facebook should be absolutely separate. Like it's crazy. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's astonishing how much of our web traffic online touches the same four companies servers. Exactly. And maybe even the same five, if you put Netflix in there, it's unbelievable because not only if you control the marketplace, but then you're also creating your own products and you have the ability to make money 
with the marketplace, you can also direct people towards your own products. You want, you want to know my idea? I just had this idea the other day. Someone should build a Chrome extension so yeah. that anytime you're on an Amazon product page, it'll overlay a similar product from a Shopify store. <laughs> Someone That's should build that. That would be really good, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's totally this idea of everything has gone so meta and we just bring it back down. Should Amazon be recommending books to us or should our you know, local small businesses be recommending books to us and stuff like that? Yeah. So what is your book about? What, what is your, what, what, what are you starting with? Yeah. So my working title <laughs> going off the way we're supposed to talk about this, but yeah, my working title was going to be how indie I'm, I'm just starting out. I'm just getting started. So I'm not really sure. Totally unsure yeah. about this. Could throw us out the window any second. <laughs> my working title is how indie hackers are changing the way we consume content and create online. So oh, that's awesome. Right. Yeah. The two parts of that are consume content. We're going towards independent publishers. We're mm -hmm. learning from Right. Do I need to be going into college or now that it's all virtual and I just have access to Zoom University, can I use these different online courses to learn specific tools like mm. the best of AWS or whatever it is and then create online? It's never been easier to be a creator. And obviously that's what your work empowers people to do is not only do you have edit video calls, you have free trainings. And, and you offer consultation, you let other people, and you've even helped me, right? All the tools that you recommended. I took a look at them when I was trying to cut the video together and you let people create content. And so it's Gumroad's doing it, Ghost is doing it, Substack's doing it, Transistor, Anchor, right? You can start a podcast, a blog, yeah. a newsletter, a course. And so it's never been easier to become a creator. So those are the two things that I wanna look at is what does it mean to empower anyone to become a creator? And what is the effect that has on the way people live their lives, the way people control their time? And is that a better world to live in? And I think it is. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. I think when you get the unfiltered version of whatever it is you want, that doesn't have to go through a TV network or I guess TV network is really like the best gatekeeper, I would call it for what I'm thinking about. But you get the best version of the thing that you want or record label or something like that. There's no, there are no gatekeepers anymore. You put out what you want, people respond. You either do something similar or you change it up and do something again. And you can iterate much faster than a band that puts out an album every two years or a TV show that puts out a season every year. I'm sure like Lee Jin's work. No. Lee Jin? Oh, she, I think she's the one who kind of coined the term um, passion economy. When okay. she was at Anderson Horowitz. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, Anderson Horowitz. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. listened to the podcast. Yeah, so she... Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. She has a... So she did that piece last year, I believe, on Passion Economy and the Anderson Horowitz blog, and now she's doing her own thing. And one, one kind of development that's interesting that you should explore is... So her and a couple other Substack people have bundled their stuff together and created their own kind of like publishing company where oh. you basically... You, so, so there's like... There's this kind of interesting thing that you, you should explore, which is like the like bundling and unbundling. There are a lot of SaaS companies that are basically unbundling features of Excel and selling them as monthly subscription services. Right. Yeah. Airtable. Exactly. Airtable is a great example. Yeah. But then there's other ways where individual creators can bundle themselves and their work together to reach a wider audience and offer a lower cost to whatever it is they're doing. So yeah. like people creating their own packages, I think it's a really interesting idea and just banding that together was, Hey, we're doing similar complimentary work. We're trying to reach the same audience. Why don't we partner together and we'll put our work together and we'll make it something that can yeah. benefit both of us. Medium does a similar thing right now where it's like all these different medium publications and then you can mm -hmm. try to write for one. So I wonder how similar that is. Um, That's interesting. I didn't know about that medium stuff. I should check into it. Obviously I know what medium is, but I, I haven't, gone to medium.com and checked out what their homepage or anything looks yeah, like. Yeah, so yeah. people only have so much time to focus on the things they care about, but it's yeah. so interesting that, yeah, it goes the other way. Cause then they, they broke it down. They're like, we're going to be independent contributors and then they build it back up again. It's and I think that we're talking about, then you can come here and come through. Yeah. Life. I think medium is cool because it's really easy to get started, but ultimately medium's goal is to keep you on medium. And that's the problem with YouTube as well. Right. Is that, when you have a platform, you're beholden to the platform, unless you have set up, spun up your own thing and you're using like a Podia or a private community or something else. Teachable, exactly. Thinkific, all that stuff works similar.
And so that's one thing I've been thinking about when I, so I started my blog like March or April and literally it was just cause like I did nothing but client work for six years. And then all of a sudden this zoom stuff start the zoom stuff started happening. And I was like, Oh wow. I just want to tell everybody about this idea, just record everything and do stuff with it. Very simple, but I hadn't really seen anyone doing it. And so I'm like, I'm going to own this space. This is, I yep. want this to be yep. my thing. And uh, so I started blogging and I was thinking about starting on a medium, but then I, and I cannot get WordPress to work for whatever reason. WordPress just is like, terrible. I used to have a WordPress blog. Did you? Yeah. From WordPress. WordPress. I know it's, I, it's very weird. Need all I tried to do WordPress there. 10 years ago and I will admit that it has improved. But still, it was not easy for me. All I want is like a nice homepage and then a blog. And I could not figure out how the hell to yep. do it. So I found this platform called Bloggy, probably on Product Hunt or something like that. And it was phenomenal. It was great. I got my own URL. I got a very simple homepage. The dev is super responsive on Twitter. So I'm like, hey, man, can you make it so I can hide the dates on these? I don't I want to be like evergreen. He's like, yeah, no problem. Let me, I'll get that going tonight. I just love that. I love, like, that's so cool. And yeah. so I probably posted like 10 or 15 times over the last like three, four months. I try to write two or three times a week. Obviously now I'm going to be writing for the book, but I also think as I'm working on the book, I can be sharing parts of it or something like that. Because yeah. that's the other thing too, is that a lot of course creators, Gumroad, et cetera, will tell you is that you don't necessarily need new ideas. All you're doing is compiling existing right. ideas, yeah, tweets and other stuff. You're just putting it into a nice package and you're just selling the convenience of it. And I thought that was really interesting because that kind of makes it much more. And even like this book course, I would never think that I would write a book or I would know how to, or anything like that. Yeah. But once I saw, I have some friends that have done it. I got interviewed a couple of years ago for someone's book. And all of a sudden this book thing just kept coming up. I was like, oh man, like maybe I should, maybe this is my time to get in on this. And it just makes it, it's broken down so finely and smartly where it's just like, all you got to do is this little piece this week. Yeah. And then this little piece next week. And then when my friends were telling me, it's like, yeah, 40% of your book is just going to be interviewing people and getting stories. And I'm like, that's all I do is interview people on camera. You know right. what I mean? Like yeah. I can do that. That's great. I do that. I've, I've literally done hundreds, maybe even a thousand interviews at this point in the last 10 or 12 years. So I was like, yeah, like I can do that. That's great. And now we have zoom. Of course, it just all came together for me in a way that I got really excited about. So yeah, that's right up your alley. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And of course I can share parts of the conversations and do all this other stuff as I'm working on it. So yeah, writing the book in public, definitely the way to go in 2020. Yeah. And I always shied away from that. I viewed people who had these Twitter storms or had blogs or put out all this content. But there's a difference, right? There's like polluting the public discourse or just putting garbage out there versus mm. putting something of value. And I lumped all the people that were just putting stuff out there into the first category. And now I put stuff out there. So my perspective on it really shifted because I realized how powerful it could be. And also the idea that there's no new ideas, but right. articulating yeah, it good. in a new way for different people can unlock understanding in, in, in a wider audience. And that's all it's about. If there's seven point whatever billion people on this earth and you have something that appeals to as we're learning through this whole india hacker movement if you have something that appeals to even a thousand people you can earn a valuable income that way or a hundred thousand people or whatever it is and yeah that's really cool and there's a lot of different changes going on right now part of what's happening with covid and what it's doing to people is terrible but part of this shift right i appreciate the ability to be able to have conversations like these if this whole quarantine period doesn't happen do i meet patrick frank like i don't know i don't think so I, yeah i wouldn't have i wouldn't have been doing the book yeah i wouldn't and that, that i gotta tell you that as you're saying that is the other reason for me doing the book is just to grow my network see what other people are doing because now that we connected we can we're going to be referring each other and hey you should talk to this person hey i got an idea for you and if i can do that with there's 350 people in this freaking class. It's crazy. Yeah. I can do that with 40, 80 people. That's 40 or 80 people or more that there's no way I ever would have made a connection with. It grows before, exponentially, you know? yeah. You can yeah. literally add everybody in the class on LinkedIn. And I definitely went through, and that may be how I reached out to you or something was, I saw, I went, I literally, I spent like an hour going through all the initial book ideas. Who can I be helpful to? And who do I think is doing something interesting? You definitely stuck out. 
probably five or 10 other people. And so, yeah, I just messaged, added them on LinkedIn, like maybe a little added to the spreadsheet. Hey, here's an idea for you. Spreadsheet. But yeah, yeah that's a massive freaking spreadsheet. But no, I, mean, I think it's a great way to, again, it's all about what are alternative ways you can grow your network right now? That's the biggest question for me. Yeah. And so I'm excited. Like I got to find people that are smarter than me in this area. Cause, and like I said, I did nothing but client work for six years. And that means that I didn't really go to networking events. My kids are five and three. So I was just home Ooh. doing kids stuff. This was going to be my year. I got a co-working space. I'm going to go to more happy hours. My kids in kindergarten and my little one, we're going to put in daycare. We had a nanny up until this point. And then poof, all that's gone. I'm trying to grasp that like, I had this idea. This was going to work out so well for me. And, yeah. but anyway, so it's going to, it is working out. It's great. I'm doing it. Yeah. And that's such a great thing about learning about indie hackers and meeting all these people is that seeing what other people are doing is so exciting to me. And it yeah. really opens my eyes to what's possible. Cause when you're talking about indie hackers, are you, I think that the biggest, uh, break between the kinds of indie hackers are you have like productized service people like me and then you have developers and SaaS people yeah are you thinking about one or the other are you more towards the development and SaaS and stuff yeah so two things about that i what i think about an indie hacker i just think about anyone that's selling a service or a product or anything like that directly to a person with no middleman no employee uh no employer no, nothing like that okay and and also at the same time right i'm a cs major in school still at the moment. And so when I thought about what community do I want to plug into, like SaaS is exploding, right? And the, the tools for creating not just SaaS businesses, but SaaS products and doing web development are exploding in terms of uh, coursework, but also, I don't know if you've heard of, right, Tailwind CSS or, but mm -hmm. there's all these libraries that are just making it easier to create amazing web experiences. So that was the second thing I was thinking of in the back of my head. I'm like, if I can talk to more people about how they got good at this thing. I think that'll be a valuable thing to do. And yeah, it's so awesome. The first person I talked to in my head, I was like, this person's way smarter than me. And, and she just went and she talked to me. She quit her job at a consulting agency to learn how to code. Wow. And I'm like, that's a very, so yeah, pretty young. Like she's, I don't know her age, but she's like in her twenties still. And I'm like, that's like a puzzling decision at face value. And so she talked about, right, viewing people who could code and people who couldn't code as this impermeable membrane that she would never be able to cross. And mm. she learned that the only difference between a developer and a non-developer, as is the difference between in a lot of other fields, is it's just this sort of curve. And some people, because of how their experience has compounded over time, are further along the curve. Is it now she's further along the curve than I am? Wait, what's the curve? Where? What are the different, like, being proficient and not proficient or? Right, yeah, yeah. It's, so I think the y-axis is proficiency and the x-axis is like time or experience. So, okay, so it's a bell curve. Yeah. Like it takes you a while to get started and then yeah. you can level up. And there's so many other interesting curves that way. So say you do like time and experience versus like confidence or something like that, right? Oh, um, yeah. You know, I just got, into college. I like that measuring confidence like that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. No, but I just got into college and I learned about all these new things and my confidence went way up here. I'm like, I'm a developer. Yeah. <laughs> I started to learn how much I didn't know. And it came all the way back down. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so now we slowly build it back up again. That's but, great. Uh, yeah. And, and the thing that just builds that is just doing stuff. It's doing stuff like this and it's talking to people, but it's also learning how to do new things. And I don't think it's really exclusive. I want to, going back to the pendulum idea, I think a good hook and good thing that you need to explore is find people that quit Facebook and Amazon and stuff like that and figure out why they quit and figure out like what the future of big tech looks like over the next 10 years. That's a good book. Yeah. I think the indie hacker thing is great and you have a lot of homegrown people and smaller people, but if you can get into them, because it's, it's a sexy thing right now with social. social dilemma and all that stuff, but it's really important conversation right now. I just finished listening to, so Tristan Harris was, was in that movie. He was on Andrew Yang's podcast. He's one of my mm -hmm. favorite guys. And they were just talking about the monetization of attention and all this stuff. And they had just, all these just amazing analogies for it with, think about like public utilities, right? Electric and gas and water and stuff like that. If it goes unregulated, 
Yep. Those power companies, they just want your lights to be on all the time. They want your furnace to be up at 90 degrees all the time. And obviously that's terrible for the environment. And so what they do is they cap it. And if the usage hits a certain point, then anything they charge the customer on top of that goes into a public fund to like fund alternative re renewable energy and other kind of ways to offset that usage. And there's nothing like that in technology, right? Yeah. yeah. Andrew Yang so has a lot of great... Yeah. Yeah. Metaphors is, it's like slot machines for, for exactly. Yeah. He talks a lot about that. And they did design it to be addictive and going back to it, like the thing that you had with that guy on product hunt, that is the ultimate situation of controlling your own data. Cause not only do you know who's creating it and who's offering that service, you trust that person. That person's not going to do anything to compromise your identity online. I'm also paying for the platform. You know what I mean? And I want, someone needs to do the math on if everyone with a Facebook account paid $2 a month, let's make it so that everybody can do it. We got rid of all the advertising. What, how much money would they be able to make? Would it be more it or less? So much. It would be so much less. So much. Less. Is that true? Yeah. No, I believe that you're asking me if I know the answer to if I know is like, no, I don't know. But I believe that very strongly. Um, if people put, if people paid 20 to $50 per year, to utilize Facebook, how much would that, so you mean to tell me that people are, the ads that they're served add up to more than 50 to a hundred dollars a year. So if we think about person. how many people are on Facebook, what is it? Is it more than a billion people on Facebook now? I think it's three is the number I keep hearing. Three billion people on Facebook. Okay. I don't know. I, yeah, I think high it's Facebook go, specifically, but. Yeah, high end, you go $50. And let's just say for the sake of argument that it's 3 billion people. I'm pretty sure they made more than $150 billion last year. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm just. I don't, have, I don't have them either, but right. So, you know, all those numbers aside, the, the crazy statistic was, right, when people were talking about boycotting Facebook near when the Black Lives Matter protests were in our face all the time, Right. The biggest tech companies boycotted them. Their top five subscribers, or not subscribers, sorry, advertisers on their platform boycotted them for, for some period of time. And it barely made a dent, right? Because yeah. so many small businesses that are promoting their ads, boosting their ads for a sustained period of time on Facebook. And another question is, right, if you have any social network in which people are paying money to be a part of it, right? So there's no point. Or, or they have two versions, a free version, you pay money, there's no ads, right? If there's no ads, does it make sense now for Facebook to collect as much information about you as it used to be doing? Because the primary- Right, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was to target you with advertisements because they knew exactly. Right. And right, I, I just got a Facebook account and I realized they're- Because they're you're like 19. <laughs> like <laughs> Oh, yeah, literally. I, I hate Facebook personally, just because there's so many features on there. It's like intimidating to me now, but they knew exactly what my network was. Cause I'd been on Instagram for five or long. I've had an Instagram account. But, I, I will say I'm not the biggest Facebook fan at all, but the marketplace has gotten really good. And Facebook marketplace. Yeah, it works really well and it works better than Craigslist to the point where I think that they're eating into Craigslist market share like crazy just because there's just things that crisis doesn't have. It's not anonymous. You have to have your profile associated with posting stuff. Then they've added rating systems. So you can see how trustworthy and you know, like their seller ratings now on everything. They just made it so good to just sell random stuff. It's such an underutilized, I don't think anybody's really talking about it, but it is awesome. Yeah. But if you think about it, a behemoth like that, they, all of a sudden they know like, all right, we got Patrick Frank on the platform. So now that he's spending his time here, why don't we just do right. a bunch of other things? That's the engine that lets them say, because I don't know what, Facebook obviously wouldn't exist if it wasn't a social network. So then Facebook Marketplace, by extension, wouldn't exist if Facebook wasn't such a powerful social network. Because it totally just piggybacks on personal profiles and in a way that a Reddit handle or something like that wouldn't, yeah. you couldn't leverage in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's such an interesting dichotomy for me because I also just got on Twitter. And Twitter is just, you really only do one thing. And that makes a lot yeah, of Yeah, I'll follow you on Twitter. I think Twitter is great. And I, I compare Twitter a lot to LinkedIn because I think 
the clients I work with, they mostly post their videos on LinkedIn because that for a couple of reasons, like, first of all, it's, it's what they're most comfortable with. And it's obviously where their professional network is. But the cool thing about LinkedIn, when it comes to posting and posting videos and posting stuff that gets good engagement is that in a way that Facebook will not do and Twitter doesn't really do. If you have something that is getting a lot of engagement, so likes, comments, shares, LinkedIn is going to drop that in the feed of your third and fourth level connections. So those are people that you don't even know. So people that you don't know are going to start getting your video in their feed. And that is an awesome way to like we've been talking about to grow your network, to get more visibility, get more face time. And so a lot of those turn into adding DM. Hey, I saw that video you posted. That was really cool. I'd love to talk to you. I signed up for your, with our call to action at the end. I got your ebook. I thought it was really cool. I'd love to talk to you about working for our organization, leading a workshop for our sales team, whatever. And do you so I think that's pretty powerful, but I feel like LinkedIn, the con and the other thing too about LinkedIn is that like the content is so weak. It's just not very good. So it's much easier to post stuff that gets, that does well, just because just like these low quality posts on LinkedIn are prevalent. But I think Twitter is like what you aspire to, right? Because that's where people who are actually interesting and doing cool stuff and are really engaging. So I feel like low hanging fruit for me is LinkedIn. I'm doing that. But then I would love to, I aspire to be one of these people on Twitter that has 10 or 20,000 followers. And I, I, I have that level of recognizability or whatever. We'll see if I get there. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm not like, I'm not the people that do really well too. If you post a thread every day for a month, you will get 1500 followers. No question. Just put a, put, put a little, put a 500 word or something blog post, condense it into a series of five to 10 tweets. And you post that every day and then make it good. And obviously it'll get better over time. That's a great way but that's hard. That's hard to carve out the time, come up with ideas, that sort of thing. And that's one of the reasons that I, I like this recording your Zoom conversation because what you're going to do now, and I think you checked out my stuff. So you're, that's awesome that you are starting to think about some of this stuff, but you're going to take this Zoom recording. You're going to throw it into otter.ai and it's going to generate the transcripts. So you'll see everything we talked about. And then you can really quickly skim through and say, oh yeah, we talked about that thing at minute 15. I wonder if that's a cool start to a blog post. So maybe you trim that segment one to three minutes and then you create an accompanying 500 to a thousand word blog post and boom, you're no longer staring at a blank page. Now you have a really good starting point to flesh out some of the ideas. And maybe I said something that got you thinking, or maybe as you were talking, you got different ideas than what you thought. So it's just like a really awesome way to get started writing and finding interesting things to share. Yeah. And this kind of compounds, right? I go, I make the one to three minute video. Then maybe I go put it on Twitter. Then maybe I put it on the podcast. Then I like take a screenshot of the tweet and put it on Instagram. I, I don't actually use Instagram for stuff like that, but the, the content, it just builds yeah. up stuff like you're talking about. Right. Awesome. And yeah, the content, it not only helps me grow my network and, and let me share with other people what I'm about, but it's a tremendous driving force behind the book, right? You're not the, the first person to mention to me this idea of like big tech got so big that now we're having the opposite reaction. Now it has to get, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. now the primary creators are going to be independent creators who then, like you mentioned as well, are going to bundle back up again, but in new and interesting ways. The person who coined the term, the passion economy on Substack. So it's, it's so like stimulating in all of those ways in that it yeah. gives me more ideas, but then it gives those ideas more ideas in terms of, okay, what can I do next? And, and I think for you, one, one avenue that I would explore is we talked to, we named a few of the companies, but these platforms that are hosting these creators, go talk to them because I think that they would be able to more broadly say, we have these people using the platform for this and we have these people using the platform to this and they would be able to introduce you to individual people if you wanted to. But I would love to talk to someone at uh, like I use convert kit for my email yeah. and yeah. their whole thing is all about like creatives and they make it pretty and it's pretty easy to use and the creative. it's a little bit more expensive, but I'm like, I want to support them because they support creatives and they support like the people that I want to be my customers. And I, until recently, like I didn't really, 
consider myself a creative just doing client work all the time, but I'm getting better and I'm getting there. I think you, you go talk to someone at ConvertKit and just say, I'm interested in indie hacking and bootstrapping and creatives and stuff like that. And I'm sure they would give you someone to talk to and that would be cool. Or like we talked about like the platforms like Podia and Thinkific and that sort of thing. So yeah, I would, um, I would love to talk to people like that. And the great thing is exactly like you talked about, right? Famous people are willing to share their ideas openly because right. that's part of the reason they got famous. So the guy that started ConvertKit, right? He has an amazing blog. And not only does he's he- He's been writing forever. It's wild. Yep. He, it's so crazy to look back and he's just been doing it for 10 or 15 years now. And these it's just amazing. Like thousands of posts. Or sorry, not, yeah, literally thousands of posts. Oh, I think so. Because he was doing like a post a day for, I think he, his goal was to write a thousand words a day for, and he did it for a year or something. Oh. It was insane. What? Yeah, isn't that wild? That's the craziest thing we've talked about today. <laughs> Three, right. Yeah. 5,000 words in a day, in a year. In a year? Yeah, go look it up. Uh, and, and he was one of the early people of this idea of building a public and sharing everything. And he came up with a book called Authority, probably like 2012, 2013. And he just started off as a your basic web designer, doing front end, CSS, stuff like that. And then he put out a book and about CSS and design and development and stuff like that. And then he he was a very traditional creator until he started the email service where he would just have various info products, eBooks and different bundles and stuff like that. And I think that was like his whole business for a while. And then he really doubled down on, on the email service, which I thought was an interesting move, but obviously it's paid off really well for him. Yeah. And I think that they've kept, they've caught up to MailChimp and then they've defined their customers so well that yeah. it's really cool to, to see what they've been doing. Yeah. And that's the one of the, one of the things I think about too, is for the blog, I use MailChimp to manage all my subscribers. But, but mm -hmm. looking at stuff like that, and that's such a great way to get an idea is he was plugged into that community and he said, what does this community around me need? Exactly. And a better email service. And that's the one thing that everybody teaches. And like we were talking about medium and stuff is like, if you own the email address, you can go anywhere with that. It doesn't matter what platform you use. You can switch email providers. You can use YouTube or not use YouTube, but the email address is gold for anyone trying to create an audience and sell products and things like that. That is one thing that he recognized really early. And obviously that led directly to him starting ConvertKit. Yeah. Yeah. That's an amazing story. And, and right. He's been blogging for so long that he sees these big trends around him too. He wrote a post called the billion dollar blog where he talked about this woman who literally wrote a blog called worth a billion dollars. And I'm like, right. Oh. Yeah. And the last question I have before we get towards the end here is, and it's the question I've sort of been asking most people is, Mm -hmm. what either makes you the most hopeful or the most excited for the future in terms of your own life or just for the world in general? Oh, oh man, that's a good question. I think there's a couple different ways to look at it. So I think on a global level, it's just access. Yep. I think we, even in our country, broadband internet is still not everywhere. And that's crazy. But I think because of some of the issues that have popped up this year and work from home and stuff like that. I think it's becoming more of a priority mm -hmm. to get fast internet to people in rural areas, but that's, that's also global too. I think that the more that people can have access to the internet, the more people will have access to be able to sell their services uh, and, and goods anywhere in the world. And so I think that access makes me the most excited. And then personally, like I said, I had, I thought I was going to just either work at a more general marketing company or be my own. I remember writing my own, making my own WordPress site in 2010 or 2009 or something. And I like, I learned about jQuery. You might not, is that a thing anymore? Do people still, no one uses that, right? not very no many people uses jQuery yeah. anymore. <laughs> but I was like, I, I got to that level and I was, oh, this is cool. So I can do web design and video and photography and all these other things. And, and then at some point you just realize, you're just like, this is, you can't do it all. This is really not a good idea. And then, and I just never really got the hang of WordPress, even though I really was following all the web design people and Don't was worry, trying man. really hard. You, I love you. It's so great. I love that. Like the next generation of people are, are already just like hating on WordPress. It's so great. But the, what I'm excited about now is all these no code tools. So for edit video calls, I built that on Landon. If you've heard of Landon, no, which I is a no code 
it's fantastic. And there's, and I, I built that website in three hours and it was wow. like, it's awesome. And so I, there's just more and more stuff like that. That's just making it easier and easier to put professional looking projects online. One thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you now, so you can hold me to it, but I have a friend who uh, works for the national archives as a researcher. And so when they're working on the film hidden figures or something like that, they call him and they're like, Hey, we're looking for footage for this and that. So he's got three terabytes worth of National Archives footage that's all public domain, free to use on his Dropbox account. And the problem is the archives, the search sucks. It's terrible. And so I want to spend half a day, I'm going to go live and I'm going to validate this idea of creating a search engine to host all of these video clips for that's awesome. people like myself. Building in public. Building in public. And I'm not even, I'm not going to build the database or the search tool or anything like that, but I'm just going to spin up a web page, collect some email addresses, talk about what this is, talk about the problem it solves. And yeah, come back in like a month. And if you haven't heard from me, you can bug me about it. So I'm telling you now, so I, I need the accountability. I've been putting yeah. it off. My buddy keeps asking me, he's like, you, you spin that thing up yet? And so my idea is basically just like a lifetime membership. We have all these, again, we have three terabytes worth of newsreels and other historical footage that we can chop up, add metadata to, make it, put it into pat, like bundles that make sense. None of this stuff that the government does, they just don't have the resources for it. So I want to make a better public domain video marketplace, essentially, that would, you're basically paying for like the search functionality. That's and it would awesome. probably be like, I'm thinking of it as maybe like a lifetime subscription. So somewhere between, I don't know, 100 to 300, something like dollars for lifetime, knowing that we're going to continue to add to it. And yeah, that kind of model is from like, there's different like music subscription sites where you try to find stock music for your videos. And there's a couple different places you can do it and you pay for annual unlimited membership. So yeah. taking from that model. Yeah. But we'll see if people actually want it, but yeah, so that's kind of my, and, then, and I wouldn't, even five years ago, it would be really hard, I think, to spin that up and see if, get enough support to actually go and build it. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah, that's the risk you take now, but you have the opportunity to make that jump and that's exciting. But it's not even a risk though. It's like the best part, right? It's just an afternoon. Do you have an afternoon? Cool. How many, like 10, 20, 50 people say, I would totally pay for this. Okay, that's good. And then, but then, okay, so you validate it and then you, maybe you get a, some money on like a pre order and that's when you really got to go to work. But so building is the reward in and of itself. Right. It, yeah, you're right. Building awesome. it is the reward. That's exactly right. That's a really good way to think about it. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we're on, you know, this book writing journey together and we're going to go build something and, and hopefully this journey will be the reward. So yeah, I mean, it's conversations like these and I, I really appreciate it. You, you making the time. Yeah. This was really fun. It was great to meet you. I'll follow you on Twitter and we'll, we'll keep in touch and I'm sure I'll be seeing a lot of you as we work on the book. All right. Awesome. All right, man. Appreciate Cheers. It. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye.